We continue in our sermon series in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. To our pastor, to our executive pastor, reverend clergy, and to all of you, my father's children, I need your prayers. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We continue with our third sermon in this series, The Music of Christmas. Archbishop Desmond Tutu said that hope is being able to see that there is light no matter how dark it is. And I believe that that is what we experience when we read these words in Isaiah 9 and 6. This verse is really a coronation psalm. A coronation psalm was sung in the ancient world whenever a new king would come to power. A coronation song would sing in, in anticipation, in expectation of the attributes and abilities of a coming king. Before the king would come to power, they would sing with expectancy that this king would do a great work. It is very dark when Isaiah gives this prophetic witness because the people were in the midst of oppression. There were two superior armies that were threatening to annihilate the people of Judah. And the people were overwhelmed with anxiety about what the future would hold. And Isaiah breaks in with this word of hope and affirmation and encouragement to share with them that the best is yet to come. Isaiah starts singing this coronation psalm. For unto us a child will be born. Unto us a son will be given. And the government will rest upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Our pastor has masterfully shared with us the first two titles in this series when he says to them that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Uh, that, that literally suggests that his name will speak of his ability to predict the future. His, his name will speak to the fact that this child that is born, this son that is given, will be able to predict perfect outcomes. It's really a forecasting of his omniscience. That is, this son that is given and this child that is born will have perfect wisdom. He will know everything about everything. And all wisdom and depth of knowledge will simply be a derivative of who he is because he will be a wonderful counselor. Not only that, he says he will also be a mighty God. That idea of him being a mighty God is a forecasting of his omnipotence. That is, not only will he be able to predict 
perfect outcomes, but he will have the power to bring it to pass. He is the omnipotent one. That is, he's got all power, all strength, all might, and all ability. There is nothing he won't be able to do. No enemy he will not be able to defeat because he is the mighty God. One of the overlooked derivatives of this idea of divine omnipotence is the fact that omnipotence also means potential. So when we say the Lord is omnipotent, we're not just claiming that he's got all power, we're also claiming that he's got all potential. That is, if you think he's done great things before, you ain't seen nothing yet. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men the good things that the Lord has in store for you. Can I tell you this morning that God can blow your mind? He can do what you never imagined. He can do what you never expected because he is a mighty God. I, I, Isaiah starts to, to sing this coronation song, but church, he sings this coronation to a people who needed hope so desperately that they missed what he was saying. Because those in Isaiah's day thought that he was singing about the birth of the son of Ahaz. They thought he was talking about the birth of King Hezekiah. Oh, but you and I have the benefit of being able to look back at what they were looking forward to. And this morning, we know who he was talking about. He was not talking about King Hezekiah because King Hezekiah was a mere mortal king. But the king that we're talking about this morning is not a mere mortal king. He is the eternal king. The king that we're talking about this morning is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. No, you can't lay these titles to some human king because no human king has perfect wisdom. No human king has omnipotent power. No human king is everlasting, but the Lord Jesus Christ is in a class all by himself. There is none like him. If you give me about 15 minutes of your time, I want to unravel for you this morning the idea of him, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our Redeemer, our Hope, our Goel, our Go-Between. I want to talk to you this morning about the fact that he is the everlasting Father. Now, the, distinct, the distinction of him as everlasting Father is this, is that his rule will never end. When Isaiah says he is the everlasting father, Isaiah is not claiming that the Lord Jesus is father in the same sense that the Lord God Jehovah is the father of the triune Godhead. No, Jesus is the son of the triune Godhead and Jehovah God is the father of the triune Godhead. But what Isaiah is claiming about Jesus is that Jesus is in a seat of authority that will last forever. Uh, because in the ancient world, the king was known as the federal head of the kingdom. And they would refer to the king who was the head over the kingdom as the father of the kingdom. They would call him the father king or daddy king or Abba king. They would look to the king as the overseer of the entire kingdom and they would honor him as their father of the kingdom. Not in a literal sense father, not in a biological sense father, but as it related to his seat 
of authority. But the distinction of this king that Isaiah is describing is that this king will never cease to rule. He is the everlasting father and he will reign forever and forever. As a matter of fact, he is going to reign forever because his character says so. Uh, he, he, is, he is known as the eternal immutable one. That, that, that simply means, church, that he is going to be who he's always been forever and ever because he cannot change. He will not change because he cannot change and he cannot change because he promised that he would not change. He is the eternal immutable Lord because he has linked his promise to be with who he is. And if he would ever cease to be who he is, then that would mean he would not be Lord ever again. But because he is who he was, and he was who he is, and he will be who he will be forever and ever, you can trust that he will keep his word. Is there anybody here who know what I'm talking about? That you can trust him based on who he is, because he's not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he's got to repent. If he said he's going to be Lord, then you can go on to sleep tonight and turn your pillow to the cold side of the pillow and go to sleep because Hebrew says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the reason I worship him and honor him and adore him is because he everlasting father you ought to sing to yourself sometimes about the attributes of the Lord you ought to sing to yourself sometimes that the Lord Jesus Christ is on the throne in charge and in control and the reason I worship him beloved is because he is never up for re-election he is Lord forevermore. I trust him because of his character. But not only that, I, I trust him because of his capacity. The reason, church, he is Lord forever is because he's made of the right stuff. When you see Jesus, you see the human God man the man who is God and the God who is man and because he's made of the right stuff you can trust him forever uh, if Jesus was just a man we would have no hope if Jesus was just a man there would be no need for us to keep coming to church every Sunday morning. But Jesus is not just a man. No, he is God and very God. He is God enough to step outside of himself and get into our existence 
so that he could be like us for us. Because in order for there to be eternal redemption, God had to become the thing that he wished to redeem. And so the eternal son of God became the sinless son of man so that sinful sons of men might become beloved sons of God. Oh, church, can I tell you the reason I worship the Lord Jesus Christ is because the Lord Jesus Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. In, in Matthew 1, 21, the angel Gabriel goes to Joseph and says to him that that which is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Ghost. And she's going to bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The, the name Jesus Church literally means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is our salvation. That, that word Jehovah is our salvation is not merely a title or a tag or a theological term but that name Jehovah is our salvation is really a testimony. And here's the testimony, church. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world back unto himself. Simply, church, God had to offer up himself unto himself so that you and I could be recipients of a grace wherein we bestowed no labor. No wonder Jonah says that salvation is of the Lord. All it means, church, is God had the capacity to take your place because you couldn't do it yourself. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Here is why he had to do it for us church because nobody else could do it. No one else could go our bond. No one else could be our goel. No one else could be our redeemer. Abraham couldn't do it. Isaac couldn't do it. Jacob couldn't do it. Ezekiel couldn't do it. Daniel couldn't do it. Hosea couldn't do it. Jonah couldn't do it. Micah couldn't do it. Nahum couldn't do it. Habakkuk could not do it. Haggai could not do it. Zephaniah could not do it. Zechariah could not do it. John the Baptist could not do it. Peter could not do it. leaped into the womb of the Virgin Mary came out doing good healing the sick raising the dead giving sight to the blind one dark Friday he went out to Calvary they hung him high they stretched him wide and he bowed his head and he died oh but church can I tell you he didn't stay there Sunday morning God raised him up from the dead and right now church he's still alive he's been exalted to the place of highest honor and right now he's seated at the right hand of the majesty on high and can I give you his job description if you don't mind he ever liveth to make intercession for you and I to shout church you don't know when to celebrate church because there are some people who don't even think you're worthy to be in church this morning there are some people who don't think that you even qualify for them to call your name to the father but right
intercession for us. The other day, the other day my daughter, Mackenzie, got herself into trouble. She did something that her mama disapproved of and so her mama sent her up to her room. And I think it hurt my feelings more than it bothered her because she just went on up to her room and as her father, I knew that her punishment was right and just. And so as her father, I could not overrule her mother's judgment. I couldn't get my baby out of the trouble she had gotten herself into. Come on now. But as her daddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. though I couldn't get her out of her punishment, I did go into the room with her to share in her punishment. Because my love for her went beyond her infraction. Come see, child of God, we have somebody. We have a high priest who can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And we have a savior who didn't just come into our trouble with us, but he took it on for us. I'm, I'm done, church. May the Lord bless you real good, but he's the everlasting father because of his character, because of his capacity. And then finally, there ought to be a celebration because these, these coronation lyrics were sung in a coronation processional. The people would line the streets of Judea and they would get palm branches and they would sing about the attributes and abilities of their king that would come. He had not become king yet, but they were in the streets dancing and singing and shouting in anticipation. He had not even been born yet, but they were already lining the streets with palm branches singing shouting unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will rest upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father now church they were singing and nothing happened yet And we got to come to church on Sunday morning and pump you up and prime you and tell you you got to shake somebody's hand and turn around and touch somebody and we've got to tell you it's time to praise the Lord when you have reasonable evidence to shout right now because of who's already come because of what he's already done what Advent is for the church. Advent is for the church. You and I singing and shouting in anticipation of what he's going to do next because of what he's already done. Can I ask you a question this morning? Have you ever tried him? Has he ever come through for you? Has he ever made a way for you? Has he ever been your strength in weakness? Has he ever been your joy in sorrow? Has he ever been your hope for tomorrow? Well, if he's been good to you, you ought not need anybody to pump you up. You ought not need anybody to choreograph your worship. You ought not need anybody to tell you to get on your feet and clap your hands. When I think about the goodness of Jesus and all time but can I tell you 
I love the Christmas season. I love Christmas because Christmas is essential to our Christian hope. For if there would be no Christmas, there could be no Palm Sunday. If there were no Christmas, there could be no Good Friday. If there were no Christmas, there could be no Easter Sunday Resurrection Day. And if there were no Easter Sunday Resurrection Day, there would be no hope. So without Christmas, Thanksgiving would not be so thankful. New Year's Eve would not be so festive. If there were no Christmas, then no other holy day would even make sense. Oh, so this morning I've come to sing the sweet music of Christmas. Are y'all going to help me sing just a little bit? Just sing the sweet music of Christmas. Come on, help me go. Tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. But can I tell you this morning, we're not just singing because of the baby that was born in Bethlehem. We're singing this morning because the baby His name. 